everyone. Welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher, or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer, or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Ashley Barlow podcast. I am joined here with my dear friend, Chrissy Bailey, who is a new friend, um, a prior participant in the special education and advocacy lab. And I'm so excited to welcome Chrissy. She's going to tell us a little bit about her story, about her family, her participation in the lab, and her success stories. So I hope that you'll stick around and enjoy Chrissy's story. Chrissy, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Ashley. I'm excited about this. Yes, it's going to be a, a good time spent together. Chrissy, why don't we start off and just have um, you kind of tell us about your family and about your background and just kind of introduce yourself to my audience. Okay, um, I live with my partner, Matt, and our two children, Juniper, we call her Junie and Johnny in Worthington, Ohio. Uh, Junie is six and she's doing uh, one last year of preschool before she heads to kindergarten in the fall and Johnny just turned three. Um, they both have uh, some special needs and uh, which is why I participated in the lab um, and we um, we like to spend a lot of time outdoors and uh, we are all together all the time during COVID so <laughs> We are surviving. <laughs> um, yes, yes, it is. It's quite a bit of together time, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about each of your kids. Why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about Miss Junie since she's older? Um, so Junie, she was a preemie um, at my 20 week scan with her. We um, found out that she was growth restricted. And after that point, I just had a slew of appointments every week. And then eight weeks later, um, my blood pressure shot up and Junie was in distress. And so I had an emergency C-section under anesthesia. Um, and she was born at 28 weeks and she was a pound, 12 ounces. Um, so, and she, she stayed in the NICU for 75 days, like right up until her due date. Um, and so that kind of, that really made an impact on all three of us, me and Matt and, and Junie herself. Um, she had a myriad of congenital issues, um, a lot of which resolve, but no like official diagnosis or syndrome or anything, um, just super early and small. Um, and when she came home, she was on oxygen and we started early intervention. And, you know, when you're, when you have a preemie, they tell you, well, they'll, they'll catch up. So you have this gestational age and their chronological age and, and they'll catch up and everything will be fine. <laughs> um, and so we were just always kind of waiting for her to catch up and, um, you know, since she didn't have a, an official diagnosis, we we just sort of thought she would, um, and she did in a lot of aspects, but um, as, we, as she got older, um, a lot of the, the impacts of just being so early sort of made themselves clear. And um, probably we didn't get an official diagnosis with her until she was five and it, sensory processing disorder and she's got anxiety. And all of that like impacts her learning in ways that we would never imagine, so. Yeah, and I think that that becomes really important as we talk about your journey in special education and how you have to advocate for her um, with things that are kind of harder to quantify. You know, it's it's hard and certain to really know how Junie's feeling and to have even gotten that diagnosis, I think is hard. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but. 
um, one question about um, that kind of journey to the diagnosis is how did that affect your um, your kind of emotional well-being when you finally got that diagnosis was there I imagine you probably had some kind of um, relief because you there was a name to it and you could figure it out but then was there also and maybe that wasn't true for you but was there also maybe some kind of um, disappointment that oh yeah we're not going to grow out of this I think it was more relief I because we had had such a hard pass up until that point I don't know that we we felt that disappointment immediately and you know my, my husband might feel differently but um uh it, it was it was more relief for me and like because I'm I'm a like solutions I need like what can I do like give me an answer so that I can do something to fix it. <laughs> I am too. Yeah. So. And you know, I think that's why in last week's podcast, I told my story and my birth story with Jack, et cetera. And I think that's why I didn't have immediate grief. And, and it's really important, I think, for parents to have grief at different parts of their lives for all humans and all experiences to grieve. But um, I'm so solutions oriented that I literally said, okay, what do we do next? <laughs> and they were like, well, he's, um, minutes old, so we're gonna like take some blood work, and I was like, "But don't I need to like join Special Olympics or something? Yeah. Like, tell me what to do." Um, but I, I also think on a serious note that there's a lot of beauty in that and a name, a name to it, a diagnosis, because you know there are things that are recommended for anxiety, there are things that are recommended for sensory processing disorder, there are protocols, there are strategies, there are specially designed instruction that are all centered around that. And if you're just dealing with kind of like global developmental delay, you don't really kind of know, like, then you have to get really, really specific into the child. And I think that's kind of a double-edged sword because I always tell people, I don't really care what the diagnosis is. I care about how it affects the child. Mm -hmm. um, so you probably always knew that she had this more like anxious personality, but now that there's anxiety, then we can start to look at more anxiety specific treatment, right? For sure. I mean, her her teachers were using a lot of sort of avoidance tactics um, to help just help her cope with with things that were hard. Um, but avoidance is not a good strategy for anxiety. So it's like the opposite of what you want to do. <laughs> My husband always says, "Why don't you just stop?" Do I have anxiety. Um, I was born with generalized anxiety disorder. Like God used a big sprinkler of anxiety with me. And then, but it's up until the time that I got hurt when I was 15, my anxiety really like drove me, you know, it's the reason why I want good grades and the reason why I like I triple quadruple overthink things when they're happening before they happen and definitely after they happen with that rumination. And so that is like, makes me so type A and so um, performance oriented, <laughs> let's say, if you say it in a positive way, but then when I experienced trauma, when I got hurt, it, um, I had PTSD, which is common, but coupled with anxiety, it never went away. So I have chronic PTSD, which then kind of gives me this like major fight or flight thing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I understand that, um, entirely like, and that's what I mean. My husband's always like, um, turn it off. Can you just stop looking? Can you just stop? And I'm like, no, I can't. No more. That is the exact opposite of what I need. Right. Um, okay. And then tell us about Mr. Johnny, our little guy. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the contrast between them is that Johnny, um, you know, he, I had a great pregnancy with him and um, I had a VBAC and he was born. It was easy labor. Um, and he had trouble transitioning um, from the womb. And when the neonatal nurses were kind of helping him um, breathe and getting blood and all that stuff, uh, my doctor came back over and she said, you know, as a mom, if I were you, I would want to hear this from my doctor right away. And I can't give you a diagnosis, but I think your son has Down syndrome. And, um, and you know, during my pregnancy, there were 
um, a couple little things uh, like with his growth, they were like, well, you know, that could be an indicator of something like Down syndrome, but you know, your daughter was also small, so we don't really know. So it, when she delivered the news, it wasn't a huge shock, um, but at the same time, it was emotional. Um, and, and, and we were more just worried about him, you know, we wanted him to be okay. Um, yeah, the worry is overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I didn't and, sleep for 48 hours because I wanted to look at Jack the whole time. And finally, Brandon <laughs> asked a doctor, is she allowed to sleep? And I was like, <laughs> a doctor, a, a pediatrician telling me, a grown up, that I'm allowed to sleep is not going to make me sleep. Come on, back to see the chapter on anxiety. <laughs> But that contrast is really interesting because here with Junie, it took five years to get that diagnosis. And with Johnny, it's like, welcome to Down syndrome. Here is a library of books, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and you know, we had been through, we had been through oxygen. We had been through um, early intervention. We had, we'd been through all of this stuff before. Um, so really, I mean, the hardest part was just adjusting to another child, um, that like transition from one child to two, two children was challenging for us. <laughs> yeah. And it, is Johnny, I don't think I know the answer to this. Is Johnny otherwise healthy medically? Yeah. Um, so we were really lucky. He, he didn't need heart surgery. Um, his, all of his holes kind of cleared up on their own and, um, he just, he needed the oxygen, uh, he, but it turns out he needed it because he has sleep apnea. Um, which he has grown out of. Um, he, he does have a, an immune deficiency. So that's making things a little, a little scary right now, just with COVID. We don't really know what that's going to look like for him, but um, you know, for the most part, he, he's great. Yeah. <laughs> he's healthy and, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting because you're right. That is the, the contrast. And so that for the most part, he's great, but that's because um, probably you kind of knew what to expect with Down syndrome and, and you knew what was coming next. And we had therapists talking to you about, okay, well, now we've um, come to midline. Now we have to deliberately reach away from midline. And there's like these protocols that you follow, um, which had to have been so different than um, your experience with Junie. Yeah. It's like, there was a manual for Johnny, you know, like th this will be his kind of, like even in physical therapy, his therapist always says, well, you know, here is how, here's like the timeline for when children with Down syndrome typically walk. And so this is what we can expect. But with Junie, it was like, we were just waiting for her to catch up. And, but we didn't know when that would happen or if it would happen or, um, so yeah, yeah, it was very, di very different. Very different. So as they, um, you know, as your kids were little and you were, um, and they still are <laughs> little, um, kind of talk about your concerns about the future, your fears about the future. What, what are you thinking about when those feelings hit? Uh, well, you know, with Junie, we were afraid of everything. <laughs> she, that The NICU experience, uh, they, you know, they kind of, made us live in fear of her ever getting sick again. If she gets sick, she'll go back to the hospital and, you know, you got to wash your hands and get your flu shots and don't, don't go out in the winter. <laughs> um, Pretend like there's a pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah we, we had practiced for the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and, and it's funny, RSV was like a huge worry for us with Junie. And last year, Johnny got, well, in 2019, Johnny had RSV and was hospitalized for RSV. Um, but we we didn't, I mean, we were worried about it with Johnny, but like with Junie, we lived in fear of it. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Isn't that crazy? You know, I've, I've thought that too. Like we've had a couple of exposures with COVID and I've thought, okay, we made it through an exposure um, you know, because we have immunocompromised uh, situations with Jack too. And um, I'm like, I definitely do not want COVID. But if we, if I've always thought like, maybe we should get him antibody tested just to see if he had it or if one of us had it to make like, so that we knew we had some peace of mind that we survived it, you know, because that is yeah. like the fear. Yeah, that's interesting. What are your kids like? What, what kind of activities do they like? What, um, tell us about them. 
Uh, Junie is super creative and she loves any kind of pretend play. Um, she has this huge imagination. She really loves dragons right now. Anything dragon related. <laughs> Love it. Her thing. <laughs> um, and Johnny loves Frozen, Frozen 2, specifically the scene where Elsa's riding the water horse. And we'll watch that over and over. Dad likes Frozen 2, Frozen movie, he calls it. Oh. Um, yeah. They love playing outside. Um, we spend a lot of time outdoors digging in the mud. Um, and they both love books and music. Um, they have a good sibling relationship, you know, um, they are so different. Their personalities are so different, but I think they balance each other out. Um, the, Junie's, she's real stubborn and she likes to be in charge and in control. And um, Johnny is really easygoing. So th they work well together. <laughs> That's really awesome. And do you ever find yourself um, kind of like, doing sensory things for Junie that benefit Johnny or doing developmental things for Johnny that benefit Junie? Is there some like blessing in disguise there? For sure. Um, so Junie has a, a little bit of a fine motor delay and you know sometimes Johnny's early interventionist will say, oh you can do this with Junie too. <laughs> this is a great hand strengthening activity. Um, and then just, you know, knowing what to, now that we're doing all the school at home, I kind of know a little bit more about these OT things. And um, so I sort of know, okay, Johnny should be able to like kind of do a circle now or a cross. <laughs> it's like one of the things that we'll work towards because Junie's doing it already. So yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, there's so many advantages to being the older sibling or the younger sibling or the middle sibling or having cousins, you know, all of the, that birth order thing I think is really interesting because I just like sociology. But in my family, of course, I don't know it any other way, but in my family, I love that we have a big brother because we've experienced other things. Um, and I know from an inclusionary standpoint, um, I know what Griffin did in the fourth grade. So I know that there's the wax museum coming up. And so I know to plan and to ask questions about how we can make the wax museum more accessible for Jack. I'm not figuring out how to parent and what happens at every phase of life or what's happening with his typical peers um, as I'm also trying to figure out developmentally how I'm gonna plug him into um, the world, this big, messy, um, fast paced world for Jack. Yeah, and that's kind of neat that you get it um, like very, very specifically for each of your kids. I think there's a big benefit in that actually. For sure, yeah. That's cool. So I know you well enough to know because we've been friends now for um, probably close to a year, I would think. Um, so I think I know you well enough to know that when you got those diagnoses and probably also while you were trying to figure stuff out with Junie and um, probably manage a pregnancy and then an infant that had Down syndrome, I know you got informed. <laughs> and in fact, we were talking about that just before we hit record here. I know that I know Chrissy well enough to know that you bought all the books and you listened to all this stuff and you probably found all the organizations, but kind of walk us through because I think there's a lot of parents that don't really know where do I get started? And you've had these two different journeys. So how did you inform yourself? Uh, well, I, I didn't mention this. I am a former children's librarian. So um, that early childhood development piece has always, you know, it's, it's my background and I, it always has interested me and something I'm passionate about. Um, so I think kind of like just having that base knowledge of child development was really important for me. Um, and I think that helps with expectations because um, you know that there is a, sort of a spectrum of development and you, and it helped me kind of put less pressure on them. Um, and, and I think that's kind of a cool thing about Down syndrome too is that I know that Johnny is going to meet these milestones. Um, 
it'll just be in his own time. And, and so I don't, I don't worry about like, he's going to walk, but he's going to walk a little bit later. So, so I know it'll happen eventually. Um, and I, I kind of just take comfort in that. Um, and, and when it does, it is something to celebrate way more. Ex- it's so much more exciting when something like that happen. I mean, walking, yes, but even just like the smallest little thing. I mean, this week, Jack took a big mess. He likes messes. So he took a big mess and he sorted out all the Nerf guns and he put all the Nerf guns in a tub. And I was like, sweet cheese. He is 10 years old and he finally organized a toy. Like, oh my, I was on a high oh. for eight hours. It, yeah. It's like, just, you can't contain that excitement over something that you know, when Griffin did that, I was like, oh, good. Okay. Now we can move on and start cleaning up, you know? So yeah, yeah I think that's really important. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I could relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I, I followed Janet Lansbury. Uh, she, her philosophy is kind of this respectful parenting. So really like giving them agency over who they are and, and just treating them like we would treat anyone and and letting them have their own feelings and and kind of letting them develop in their own their own time and and not like putting my expectations and what I think they should be doing on them has has been helpful um because I think a lot of I mean just as a new mom you you can you get all this pressure of like when are they talking when are they walking or are they doing this or and and every child is different and sort of just respecting where they're at um, lets them be their own little people. (laughs) Yeah, Um, that's so true and so important. I know that you have um, found a lot of resource in um, some local disability organizations. Why don't you tell us about those? Yes. So um, as soon as Johnny was born, we were connected with uh, the Down Syndrome Association of Central Ohio, uh, DeSaco. And, and that, it was so amazing to have that um, immediately because with Junie, we, we didn't have like a connection to kind of any organization. We, we utilize her therapist a lot, like her, her help me grow her early intervention. Um, I learned so much from, from them and just from her private therapist too. Um, but there wasn't like one place where we could go for information for her. And I know that I can reach out to DeSaco with any questions that I have. I, and I, I even reach out with questions that I have about Junie and they, they sure. guide me. So, um, and that's actually how, how I got connected with you was I had a question about Junie's IEP um, and, and they pointed me in the right direction, so. Yeah, and that's really a, a, a great thing. And I love to encourage my audience to find organizations, even if there isn't, even if your child doesn't have a diagnosis or there isn't like a sensory processing disorder moms group in central Ohio or um, Eastern Pennsylvania, whatever it is, um, you know, there are organizations that are national or that are online that where you can find that moms talking to moms or um, networks of here's an organization that can couple you with an attorney that does special needs trusts or um, someone, an advocate that can help you with your educational piece or, um, you know, we don't know the answer to that feeding question, but maybe there's a mom or a dad in this community that's experienced something similar. So why don't you, why don't we pair you up with somebody else that had that feeding thing or that surgery or whatever. And there's a lot of um, strength in numbers really is what that comes down to, right? For sure. Yeah, and you know, with Junie, um, a lot of her anxiety kind of presented as possibly being on the autism spectrum. And so, and we went through two ADOS evaluations. So I did connect with our um, local um, autism society of central Ohio. And, and I went to like some of their restorative yoga classes and stuff. And so even though we didn't have that diagnosis, we were, we weren't sure. And, and it was great to connect with them. It, It did make me feel like, okay, I can, I can reach out to them if I have a question or need anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's another really strong point. And I make that point a lot when I have clients that 
have um, a child with a diagnosis where there isn't kind of this automatic network. So, you know, something that's really, really rare or that isn't common here in the United States or something like that, I say, you know, it doesn't have to be that you plug into Down syndrome, right? Like we have a lot of families in, in our greater Cincinnati Down syndrome organization that have um, a child that have some other chromosomal addition or deletion, but it looks similar to Down syndrome, you know, that children also probably have speech delays and low muscle tone and cognitive impairments, et cetera. Um, and again, <laughs> I don't care as much about the diagnosis when I'm relating to other people. I care about the similar experience. You know, if you've got somebody that um, struggled to get over this hump reading, than what worked for you. Because something that works for a child with dyslexia might work for a child with Down syndrome or a child with CP or a child with um, a cognitive impairment with no identified source. Um, I just want to talk to somebody with a similar experience. And I think that's a really big thing for my audience to know is it doesn't have to have a name. Somebody with a shared experience can really teach you a lot. For sure. And, um, oh, were you going to say something? Sorry. Well, I was just going to say uh, that's also a cool thing about Down syndrome, though, is you know you're immediately connected to this community, and it's it's a community that we wouldn't be connected with if if we did if we hadn't had Johnny, and we have kind of nothing else in common with, with some of the other families. But I know that they will be there for us, and that I can reach out, and and I think there are a lot of different organizations like that. Um, I, I reached out to Disability Rights Ohio with a question once and and it's just like this understanding of you know we're here to help you and we're going to point you in the right direction if we don't have what you need then go here you know yeah you know I wasn't going to say his name but you might know him do you know um Rob Snow at Stand Up for Downs the improv group mm -hmm. well I don't know him personally but you know, that organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand Up for Downs, just if anybody else doesn't know, is an improv group that um, does improvisation, like comedy, for um, adults with Down syndrome. And they are located in the Akron, Ohio area. I think um, we could even call it Greater Cleveland, I think. But um, Rob Snow, I met them on vacation in the Florida Keys. And really strangely, we were at a pool at a, um, you know, hotel kind of a place. And there was a kid that was a little bit older than Jack who was really swimming. And Jack was kind of an emergent swimmer. And the dad was like, oh, I remember when my son was swimming like that. And you're, and he said to me, you're part of the club. And I was like, yeah, and I could just tell that he, you know, was similarly minded to me. And so we ended up chatting for a second. It turns out we live, you know, three hours away from one another. And I see him at a bunch of national conferences that I go to and whatnot, because he runs this organization, which is phenomenal. They're so great. Um, and, um, but as we started talking, it is, it's, it's the club. And there's so many shared experiences that we have. Um, <laughs> As we were preparing for this, I told you if if you say a bad word, we could cut it out. I call it, I won't say the bad word so that we don't have to cut it out. I call it the BS radar. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we um, parents stereotypically of children with disabilities, we don't have time for any kind of BS. Like I have a BS yeah. radar that is so strong. Somebody starts BSing me, I'm like, mm, don't have time for that. See you later. Shut it down. I call it the polite brush off. It's it's from this Jackie Kennedy etiquette book. She did something that she called the polite brush off where you <laughs> like politely dismiss somebody. I don't have time for that, that's BS. And there's lots of other things that we in the disability community, you know, kind of tease about or, or know or whatever, but that like, we share that and we can tease about it and we can talk about it and be like, I don't have time for that, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. I just love that. I love that mm -hmm. in our community. Yeah, so that's what um, that's how Rob and I bonded back. I don't know five or so years ago. <laughs> that's awesome. Bonded. Yeah. Um, so, when did you start thinking about your kids' education and special education? Um, well, you know, with Junie, it was a long road. <laughs> when she she started at an in-home 
preschool when uh, when she was about three and a half. And, and that was kind of when we were like, okay, something's happening. Um, just social interactions were really hard. Um, you know, there were only five or six kids there, um, but any kind of loud noise was just so overwhelming. Um, and, and so that, at that point we were like, well, what is this gonna look like for her if she, when she goes to kindergarten? How are we gonna manage like a, a classroom with 20, 25 kids <laughs> if it's hard with five? Right. Um, and so we actually had, we stopped her early intervention um, before she turned three because she was doing so well. Um, and we, so we, we weren't like immediately connected to the public preschool. We kind of had to initiate her evaluation. Um, and, and I, I did that because we, we just didn't know what else to do and we knew we needed some help. Um, and so she, she, she had her IEP, but she was kind of doing itinerant um, services while she was still at her in-home preschool. And, and so it, it wasn't something that I felt like I needed to know how to advocate for her. It was just like, we need a little extra therapy um, and we don't really know what's going on quite yet. Um, but, you know, as, as soon as Johnny was born, um, I, I think I had a, a really like ableist definition of what like education should be and what learning should look like. And, and so that was one of my like worries for him was, well, will, will he be able, will he be able to learn and go to school? And I, you know, that was my, my big, biggest concern probably. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he's shown me that of course, <laughs> of course he can, he can do anything that he wants to do. Um, and so I think um, I'm, I'm learning about that role of being an advocate for him, but also, you know, like letting him kind of determine his own path too. Um, and, and, and I don't know what it's gonna look like. I, I'm definitely learning as I go, but uh, I had sort of heard through the grapevine that he might not have the opportunity to, to go to our neighborhood school. We live in a really like tight knit neighborhood. We can, we can walk to the elementary school. Um, and, and that was probably what sort of sparked my, my uh, interest in advocacy. And, you know, that that's a huge thing for us is let, you know, just letting him have any opportunity that he would have if he didn't have a disability. Um, that, that's really important and we're going to do whatever we can to to help him achieve that um, well that's it I mean that's yes I and I certainly understand that so you identify that as kind of your the problems um, the things that we need to fix and so um, had you informed yourself otherwise before you sought help and thought, what's the special education and advocacy lab, or how had you kind of prepared yourself otherwise before you took my course? So, so like I said, with Junie, it was all like by the seat of my pants, like the night before her IEP meetings, I would Google frantically and oh, they say I need a notebook. Let me get a notebook together really fast. <laughs> okay, what else do I need? I, I have to write goals. What are goals? <laughs> um, <laughs> I can picture you like throwing the tax documents out of a binder and like shoving in some like, I don't know, what, what the pediatricians say. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, I, I had no clue. Um, but again, I, I didn't put a lot of pressure on it for her. Um, and, and you know, I the the person that I connected with through Disability Rights Ohio, she was the one that said, you know, you need to start this advocacy journey with your daughter. She's the one that's going through it right now. <laughs> so so um, don't wait for Johnny, like start with her. Um, and, and, and that's really what it's been is, you know, a lot of this stuff, Johnny just, we just wrote his IEP. He just turned three. So, um, so I, I mean, I was advocating with his early interventionist, but that kind of felt differently um, than, than the IEP process. So, um, so yeah, I, I was Googling and I, I didn't know 
the parts of an IEP document. And um, we, and, th and then when COVID hit, it was just like a whole new set of problems. Like, okay, how do we meet these social emotional goals at home when she's not around any peers? <laughs> um, and how does Johnny do his initial ETR when he, he's on Zoom? Uh, and, and so that, that sort of sparked me too, to, I need to, I need to know this stuff. Um, and, and, I, and, and I had reached out to, I, DeSacco had done a couple of different uh, like webinars for IEPs during COVID and I, I attended, but I didn't really think I was gonna need them. And then um, there was just like a little snafu that we had um, and it was more of a communication breakdown with, with the school about something in Junie's IEP. And, and I reached out to DeSacco and I reached out to you kind of simultaneously and um, also read on your website about the, the special education lab. And I was like, I need to do this. This will solve all my problems. <laughs> <laughs> Give awesome. me all the information. <laughs> That's an endorsement. So tell us about your experience. So you, you identify the problems, you're living in a pandemic with two kids that are on IEPs or in intervention services. And you're like, I need the help. Um, so you enroll in the special education and advocacy lab, um, and tell us about how it went for you. Uh, oh, I mean, it was a great experience. It, I love that I could do the modules kind of on my own time. Um, I, that was really helpful for me because it, it took the pressure of off of like, okay, I got to schedule this meeting at this time. Um, so I could just do them at my leisure. And I think I got a lot out of that too, because I can, I could do it when I knew that I was going to learn best. And I, uh, um, you know, I, I took notes on all the modules and um, I got a lot out of attending the coaching calls with you um, and some of the other participants in the lab. For me, um, it's helpful to, you know, I, I loved watching the modules on my own, but then also like having that opportunity to talk about them um, in person or on the coaching calls was was really a huge benefit. Um, and then I, I also love the way the course was scaffolded, just kind of uh, sort of the basics of the law, um, but then having those advocacy tips in there and knowing like my what what my rights are as a parent. I mean, I had never thought about any of that stuff before I took the lab and and I don't know that I would have learned it as I went along in their education I think I would have just sort of got by if if I uh if I hadn't done the lab I would have been googling every night before before the meeting so yeah imagine that um so well you know we tease you because you were the perfect student you always came with your homework and your binder and your pencil and we were like yeah, if we had known you were a librarian, imagine what we would have said. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I, of course, I'm thrilled that that was your experience. And I think you hit the nail on the head and why I created the lab the way that I did. Because if you have a problem, you probably are not going to start back with that legal foundation. Um, so what's the importance of having the legal foundation before you address the problem? How has that helped you? Well, I mean, in the lab, you, you say, prepare, like, act like you're going to have to go to court. And so I know now that like, even though that's really, probably not something that's going to happen, hopefully not. Um, I, at least I, I will have all my ducks in a row. And, um, and, and I think it's just really important as a parent to know that legal foundation, even if I don't know like all the laws are off the top of my head or I can't like quote them in the IEP meeting, not that I would wanna do that anyway, but <laughs> knowing my rights as a parent on that team, I don't think I had thought of myself as a team member before. Um, it's really empowering. And, and, it, and it, it's given me the confidence to speak up about what I feel like my kids need. You know, I, I am my kid's advocate and, and I can do that with more confidence now because I know it's, it's my like legal right <laughs> to, to do it, you know? 
Oh, Chrissy, I'm so happy. That's what it's for. That I, that just thrills me so much that it had that impact on you. Has it already influenced your advocacy in concrete ways? Is there some objective that has been achieved as a, you know, since you've um, completed the lab? Oh, for sure. And, you know, it's just easier when you have that, like, evidence-based knowledge. It's so much easier to speak from a place of confidence too. And you're not just kind of like, well, I think I think that I have the right to do this. It, it's much, it's empowering, like I said, but um, yeah, you know, I, I have my binders organized in a way that I know where everything is now and I can find those old documents. Uh, it took me two days to find all of their old paperwork. <laughs> Um, I was super disorganized before. Um, and well, in your defense, you have two people. So <laughs> it would probably take me two days for one person. And I teach people how to do it the right way. So <laughs> don't be too hard on yourself. Okay. Um, but I, I wrote their future planning statement. So I was doing the lab when we were writing Johnny's IEP, which was super helpful to kind of have those uh, go hand in hand. And um, I, I felt really good about his future planning statement. And um, I've written one for Junie too. That, you know, her first one was a sentence. Um, so now <laughs> I know that, that even though to me right now, it's just preschool, but it's not just preschool. It's, it's their entire education and what we're building in preschool it builds on what they will be doing as adults and what the skills that they're going to need as adults. And, and I hadn't looked at it from that perspective. Uh, you know, I was kind of just taking it one day at a time um, before this point. And, and to have that, like that broader picture, I think it's so helpful in terms of advocating for them because it's not just that they need to learn how to lace beads to lace beads, but like they need those fine motor skills to to cook in the kitchen or, you know, to whatever they're going to need them for. Um, and then I, I've, I think our communication strategies, that was something that we were struggling with a little bit before COVID and um, before I took the lab was communicating with her teachers. Um, and I, I think that we've got a good strategy. I, I send a Sunday email um, every week and I actually see the teacher using that information um, from the emails. I, I see them her using it in our weekly Zooms with the kids, um, which is, is, is awesome um, to see her kind of using those facts and things that I've mentioned to her um, to putting them into practice with the kids. And then um, the other thing that I wouldn't be doing um, if I hadn't taken the lab is I'm gonna be a surrogate parent for our district. So I'll be the parent representative for um, kids who are wards of the state or unaccompanied homeless children or um, maybe kids that, you know, they can't contact, they can't get in contact with the parent. And I'll be that representative at the IEP table for those kids. So uh, I just love that. I am so, I'm so proud of you for doing that. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, there's a huge need for, for surrogate parents um, in our district. And, and, and it kind of sounds like in lots of districts, there's a need um, yeah. because, you know, they, in the training, they mentioned that we might be called to another district that's outside of our district. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a, a daunting task if you don't know a little bit about IEPs and the laws and all that stuff. Like um, a, a lot of the people in the training have sort of a, a teacher background or an advocate background or like a parent mentor sort of they so they kind of already have that foundation and and the lab is what gave me that that confidence to to take on that role so that's awesome i i'm so excited that you like took it to the next level and you're going to take that knowledge and that information and um help even more people and particularly you know one of the um, really strong foundations upon which this business is built is um, helping to resolve the disparity of information and the disparity of outcomes that are available for children that need those surrogates at the IEP table, children of minority races and ethnicities, children that are living in poverty. And so 
Um, to see that the lab is having that impact immediately is um, just really, really heartwarming for me. And I thank you for going the extra mile with your advocacy also. Oh, well, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I really learned so much from it and I am really I, grateful. Desaco gave me um, a scholarship to, to participate in the lab and you know, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to, to do it without them. And so having that opportunity through them and then your connection with Desaco too, is just, it, it, it's like all the, all the, the stars were aligned. <laughs> so. so I do have one, one follow-up question um, when you were talking a moment ago. Um, and that is, you know, you said you would have been taking it one day at a time. And I think so many parents in the special education and disability communities have been and are constantly overwhelmed. I mean, you know, even if it's just um, cleaning up extra messes or different messes or researching the solution or um, exhausting yourself with the behaviors, we have meetings, we have therapies, we're exhausted. Um, and I probably just made people anxious kind of giving the list. Um, and so, you know, but at the same time, there's this importance to educating ourselves about special education. And so if, if somebody's listening today and is like, yeah, I'm one of those day by day people, but I can't pull myself out of it. I could never devote eight hours or 45 minutes um, a week for 10 weeks um, because I'm stuck in day by day. Kind of what, how would you, um, address that concern for somebody? That definitely crossed my mind when, when I uh, decided to, to commit to it. Um, like, you know, 10 weeks sounds like a long time. It went by really fast. Um, and, and I think that speaks to, you know, the quality of the modules and, and the lab itself is that you're not like sitting there bored for, for an hour while you're watching. Like there, it is chock full of content that is really useful and important. Um, so yeah, that was definitely something that I was a little bit worried about, um, just like juggling everything with, with COVID and the kids. And, but, um, you know, I think depending on your learning style, you can, the nice part about it is you can kind of tailor it to how you learn best. And so if you're, you know, if you're going for a walk or something, you can put your earbuds in and do a module while you're walking. Or um, I think there are ways to, to kind of carve out you, and you, I didn't, you know, there would be some days where I would watch like half a module and then watch the other half the next day. So it's really nice that you can kind of take it at your own pace. Um, and I think it's just so worth it. You know, um, it has, you know, having that knowledge has lowered my stress level. I feel like because I have done this training, I, I know what to do when, you know, when a crisis ar arises or I, I, I'm not just like putting out fires now. I'm, I'm prepared. So I'm not reacting. I'm, I'm more prepared for, for what might come up. That's Awesome. I mean, that's the goal. And I'm so happy that that was your experience too. Chrissy, thank you so much for joining me today. I miss you. I'm used to seeing yeah. you every week. <laughs> so we need to do Zooms more often just to check in as friends. Yes. Um, and so thank you um, so, so much. And um, if you're interested in joining the lab, I will say that it is open. You can go to my website, ashleybarlowco.com. And um, you should probably get a little pop up for the lab. Enrollment is open now, and we would love to join you and for you to have outcomes similar to Chrissy's. I'll catch you next week on the Special Education Advocacy Podcast with Ashley Barlow.